Wonderful. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My name is Sarah Grant, and I'm representing the city and county of Broomfield, and I am the chair of the Dr. Cog Transportation Advisory Committee. And thank you to Vice Chair Justin Schmitz for chairing the last two meetings. Much appreciated. Thank you. I call to order the August 26, 2024 Dr. Cog TAC meeting at 1.31 p.m. This is an in-person and live stream meeting format, and members of the public attending by Zoom have the ability to mute and unmute themselves and share their webcam. Those attending online, please make sure that you've typed your name and it reflects your first and last name and your representation. We ask that those intending to speak use the raise hand button to ask a question or comment on an agenda item. If you have any technical questions, you can direct those to staff in the chat box. As a reminder to members and alternates here in person, please press the unmute button on the bottom of your mic stand and make sure the light on your microphone is on and you're prepared to speak. Please speak directly into the microphone so your voice will amplify and please announce your name and representation when asking a question or making a comment for the record. During the business agenda, TAC members and alternates may speak or ask questions and members of the public may speak during public comment. And right now, Dr. Cog is sending around the sign-in sheet and at this time, the TAC members and alternates here in person will introduce themselves for roll call. We'll start with uh, Carson. Carson Priest, uh, TDM Special Interest Seat. Brody Ayers, Aviation Special Interest Seat. Mike Whitaker, Lakewood. Christina Lane, Jefferson County. Here at Slater, City of Boulder. Michelle Riccio, Adams County. Jeff Boyd, Housing Special Interest. Larry Nimmo, uh, Douglas County, City of Castle Pines. Cam Kennedy, Dr. Cog Staff. Sarah Grant, City and County of Broomfield. Nick Rieger, Dr. Cog Staff. Jessica Micklebust, Colorado Department of Transportation, Region 1. Jim Eusen, uh, CDOT Region 4, Greeley. Chris Agahan, CDOT Division of Transportation Development. Zeke Lynch, Douglas County. Bill Saray, RTD. Chris Hudson, Douglas County, Town of Parker. Justin Schmitz with Douglas County City Loan Tree. Tom Wright, Douglas County, Town of Council Rock. Afternoon, everyone. Doug Rex, Dr. Cog. Dunhill House, City and County of Denver. Ellen Clam, Dr. Cog. Lauren Curtis, Dr. Cog. Rick Pilgrim, Environmental Special Interests. David Kretzinger, Denver. Um, at this time, um, I'll turn it over to Jacob Rieger for any um, announcements. Thank you, Chair Grant. Um, so we have several membership updates today. Um, let's start with Adams County. Um, new member, um, Jenna Hahn from Commerce City. Welcome, Jenna, replacing Sean Poe. Um, Chris Chauvin, a new alternate, although Chris has been on TAC before, but a new alternate uh, for Adams County. Um, for Arapahoe County, uh, Victor Rochelle, who I don't think is here today, is a new um, alternate public works director for City of Littleton. Um, and then um, Douglas County, I think we've said hello to Zeke Lynch in the past, but since he's here today, we'll say hello to Zeke um, as a relatively new alternate um, to TAC, so we're glad that you all are here. Um, I also see a few alternates here in person that typically are online, so appreciate having you here today. And then finally, we need to say goodbye to someone, um, and this is really hard because this person is a real institution. Um, Rick Pilgrim is our environmental special interest seat representative. Um, he's been um, in that seat on our Transportation Advisory Committee since 2016. Today is his last meeting, um, and we want to wish him a fond farewell. So I'd like to read just a couple things about Rick um, and his career. Um, Rick has more than 40 years of experience. He began his professional career at RTD. Um, he's been a senior transportation engineering and planning consultant at several um, consulting firms culminating in HDR. His HDR positions include Senior Vice President and National Transportation Business Development Director. 
Um, some of his um, well-known projects just in Colorado include the Intermountain Infrastructure Exchange, uh, the Aerotropolis Visioning Study, Central Platte Valley Light Rail Transit Extension, US 36 Managed Lanes and BRT Project Development, Northwest Rail, which he's working on now, um, and Mobility Choice Blueprint. In Rick's distinguished career, he's been mayor of the town of Bomar from 2006 to 2016. Um, he represented Bomar as an alternate on the Dr. Cog board from 2013 to 2016. As I said, he's been on this committee since 2016 as our environmental special interest seat representative. He's also been the vice chair and chair of the Metro Mayor's Caucus back from 2009 to 2011. And he's on the board of director for Civic Results um, since 2021. Um, and those are just some highlights of his very distinguished career. More than many of those things, although I will say if most of us accomplish half of that in our careers, we'd have pretty distinguished careers ourselves. Something I really have appreciated about Rick is that he's very pragmatic. He's very thoughtful. Um, he has been a calm, steadying, um, really important voice on this committee for many, many years. Um, hard to imagine not having him, but Rick, we're really going to miss you so very much. Um, and I just want to say thank you and honor your service both to Dr. Cog um, and to the region. Thank you, uh, Chair Grant. Madam Chair, if, if I could have a moment. Um, what, uh, Jacob, thank you very much. Um, uh, I, I don't... Uh, it, it's it's hard for me to accept um, terrific comments like that. I really appreciate it. Um, I, I'll say that, uh, geez, I worked for, uh, it wasn't CDOT, it was the Department of Highways in the late 70s uh, for Bill Vidal, which was, that was a true delight. Uh, and then I had a chance to work for RTD when we went through the first uh, voter referendum that turned down the light rail program in 1980. Uh, and then, then I got involved in the consulting business and went to different states. But um, through that time, I've, I've watched the evolution of Dr. Cog and uh, the way Dr. Cog has become much more um, uh, engaged and I, I'll just say dynamic in uh, what we need to do as a region. Uh, and we're one of the, the, well, we are the largest regional transportation district area in the country, uh, and that, uh, that district is actually a little smaller than the Dr. Cog district. Uh, what, what Dr. Cog has done with the programs, with the programming of, of money, and the enabling of, uh, really transportation planning so that it's the best result for our citizens, I think has been terrific. I, when I worked in, in the Dallas-Fort uh, Worth area, and this is as consultants, uh, or, and that's North Central Texas COG, or SANDAG uh, in San Diego, um, uh, the MAG Transportation Planning Office, or MAG uh, Association of Governments in Phoenix, uh, I always wondered why they were a, a little more active in doing planning projects. And so I'm really encouraged by what Dr. Cog has taken on in the recent years. Uh, you, you've got a terrific staff. You've got a terrific set of committees. And uh, I think that only means good things for us as a region. So I've, uh, I've appreciated the time here, and I thank everybody for that opportunity. Thank you, Rick. We will certainly miss you, and thank you for all of your contributions to the Denver region over the many, many years. Welcome to Jenna and Chris, Zeke, and Victor. Really appreciate uh, these, our new representatives coming online. And now we'll move on to public comment. Um, if you've joined the meeting by Zoom, please raise your hand by pressing the raise hand button, and we'll call on you to begin speaking. If you've joined by phone, please raise your virtual hand by pressing star nine, and we'll call on you by the last three digits of your phone number. And staff will unmute you, and you can unmute yourself by pressing star six on your phone. You will have three minutes to speak, after which we will ask you to wrap up, your, and your line will be muted. As a reminder, after public comment, only TAC members and alternates will be able to partake in the discussion regarding each agenda item. Do we have any um, public comment uh, here in person?
Do we have any online? Thank you, Madam Chair. I do not see any hands raised uh, online. Seeing no public comment here in person or online. We'll move on to the next agenda item, which is the meeting summary for July 22nd. This is attachment A in your packet. Is there any discussion, corrections, or questions about the July 22nd, 2024 TAC meeting summary? Okay. Well, the I seeing none, the meeting summary will, will stand as proposed. Well, we'll move on to our first of two action items today. The first is um, item number four, which is the fiscal year 2024 to 2027 transportation improvement program amendments. This is attachment B in your packet. And Josh Schwank, senior planner, uh, will lead this agenda item. Thank you, Chair. Good morning, everyone. Um, so the first uh, proposed change to the Transportation Improvement Program this morning is related to our air quality improvement set aside. Uh, this is funding that is given uh, directly to the Regional Air Quality Council to help fund some of their programs. Uh, traditionally, they have a contract associated with the funding available sort of per tip, um, and they do have some unspent funds associated with their prior contract um, associated with the prior tip. Uh, so we are proposing moving uh, $2 million, rolling that over from the prior tip into the current tip so that they can use that for their current projects. Uh, next, we have the addition of $23 million in federal capital investment grant funds to the East Colfax bus or East Colfax BRT project. Uh, this would bring their total CIG award up to $150 million. Next, we have a uh, new federal discretionary grant award to Denver. Uh, it's approximately $35.5 million in federal neighborhood access and equity funding. Um, this is associated with the Reconnecting Communities and Neighborhoods Program for the Reunited Denver Project in the GES neighborhoods. Next, we do have a couple of um, uh, transfers of funding within the TIP. So when a project gets listed in multiple places in the TIP, we try to consolidate that funding into one location. Uh, so we are proposing moving uh, $3.8 million from the Region 1 bridge on system pool and $21.5 million from the Region 1 surface treatment pool and putting that into a new project for Interstate 25 resurfacing. Um, I know the mileposts aren't particularly clear, but this is Central 25 sort of between roughly I-70 and Alameda, um, and then the addition of $1 million in strategic safety funds to that project as well. Um, so happy to take any questions about any of these proposed amendments. Otherwise, I do have a proposed recommendation there on your screen. Thank you, Josh. Is there any questions or comments from the TAC regarding this agenda? None. Mr. Mormon. Uh, could you could you lay up your mic? Okay. How about now? There we go. Hit the right button finally. Okay, I move to recommend the Regional Transportation Committee the attached project amendments to the fiscal year 24 through 27 Transportation Improvement Program. Okay. Justin Schmidt. I'll second that. Okay, so we have a motion and a second. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed? No, any abstentions? This is unanimous. Thank you. Thank you. Josh? 
Um, the second of two action items today is item number five in your packet. This is the non-discrimination program update, attachment C in your packet. And this will be presented by Alvin Vidal Sanchez with Dr. Cog, Regional Transportation Planning Program Manager. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as introduced, Alvin Bidad Sanchez, program manager here at Dr. Cog. I'm joined by my colleague, Cole Nieder, senior transit planner. So if there are any questions around one of our particular plans, he'll be here to assist with that. We kicked off this uh, update effort back in April of this year. This is our required three-year update to our non-discrimination program. Um, here at Dr. Cog, four plans make up our non-discrimination program. I'll go over each of those on the next slide. Um, after we did kick off that effort in April, we looked at updating our various data sets that we use in these plans. So that included our equity data set where our equity index sits, as well as our investment analysis using our most recent transportation improvement program. May was really about us finalizing that document, getting it ready for public review, so making sure it was accessible. June was our public review period that ended in July with a public hearing before our board of directors. And now we're before y'all here for the recommendation to our RTC and ultimately uh, RTC recommendation and board adoption is what we're aiming for next month. Uh, we do have a federal deadline of October 1st to have these plans adopted and submitted to our federal partners. Like I mentioned, uh, here at Dr. Cog, our non-discrimination program is four plans. There were three existing plans when we started this update, the Title VI Implementation Plan, the Limited English Proficiency Plan, the Americans with Disabilities Act Program Access Plan all existed during our last reporting periods. A new plan for us here is our Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Plan. This one covers our Section 5310 funding that we receive from the Federal Transit Administration. Um, so moving forward, this will be another uh, one of our core documents for our non-discrimination program. Each of these covers a different piece of our federal or state requirements that come with accessibility, inclusivity, non-discrimination. Um, you'll hear me use those three terms pretty interchangeably throughout this presentation. I'm going to give an overview of what each of those updates look like for each of the plans. I'll start with our Title VI plan because it is our most expansive of the four. A key piece of this is a demographic profile of our region. Um, the update here was moving from our seven vulnerable populations to our 10 indicators that are included in our equity index. So those are listed on the screen right now. People of color, people with low income, people with limited English proficiency, older adults, youth, people with a disability, households without a motor vehicle, people born outside the US, single parent households, and housing cost burden households. So in the plan now, each of these indicators, characteristics, group, community has a two-page spread, as an example is shown on the screen right now, providing a quick definition of what we mean by people of color. In this case, how are we calculating that? A table showing county breakdown, so you can see how many people of color exist in each county, live in each county, and what that percentage is compared to the total population. And then a map showing that geographic spread across our 10-county area. So for each of those 10 indicators listed, there is a two-page spread showing uh, what that geographic concentration looks like across our region. Second key piece in our Title VI implementation plan is a transportation investment analysis. This is where we leveraged our equity index, which we completed about a year, year and a half ago. So we used the investments in our most recent transportation improvement program and evaluated those by project type to see how potential benefits, potential burdens were landing across the region. And so we were able to leverage that new index with our transportation improvement projects to see um, how that shook out across our region. So that's a, a new update for us, um, shifting away from just a, a binary yes or no analysis and looking at how many tracks are covered by a project. I mentioned it's our most expansive plan. It also includes information around different policies that we have in place here at the agency, how our board and committee works. So this committee, um, how can members of the public engage through the TAC? How is membership selected through the TAC? How are folk from um, other groups included in the TAC's decision-making? It also includes information just on Dr. Cog itself. When we did this plan three years ago, we were uh, around 120 employees. We've grown since then to be a little under 150. So there are some new plans and projects that we're covering in the plan. How are we making sure all of those are inclusive, accessible, non-discriminatory? 
subrecipient monitoring, we do pass through some funds that's related to our 5310 program funding. Um, so making sure our subrecipients are also following the Title VI requirements. What data do we use? What data do we have available to make sure our decisions are equitable, equal, um, aren't, aren't having a disproportionate impact on any particular community in the region? And then finally, what is our public participation philosophy here at the agency? How are we ensuring folk from various different backgrounds, ages, abilities are able to engage with us through our different products? Moving over to our limited English proficiency plan. This one also, also has an assessment of the Denver region, but this one looks at limited English proficiency. This one was a more routine update for us. We did just update the data underlying this plan. So uh, the two page spread on your screen is an example of geographic distribution of people with limited English proficiency across the region. We are able to break it down by language groups. That was a change from our last, um, our last plan update. Uh, with the data changing, we're no longer able to show the top seven to 10 languages in the region. It's now by language group, unfortunately. Um, so we're not able to get any more granular than those, those four language groups, Spanish, Asian, and Pacific Island languages, other Indo-European, and then other, unfortunately. Other information included in the plan are county level breakdowns. So if you wanted to see how many people with limited English proficiency live in your county, that's available. We do provide flashcards that come from the US Census Bureau, I believe, just to help identify what people might be speaking when they come to a meeting. And then we do provide a map of English language learners by school district as well. Underlying our limited English proficiency plan is a four factor test that we do here at Dr. Cog just to figure out what we're able to provide in a language other than English. The first test is the number or proportion of people with limited English proficiency, how likely they are to encounter our work. Factor two is um, how often they're likely to encounter our work. Three is how important that work is to their lives. And then four is what resources do we have available to us as an agency, recognizing we cannot translate, interpret every meeting, every document that we have. Um, so how do we prioritize all of the work that we're doing to make sure that key information is getting out to members of the public? Shifting to our ADA program access plan, the big update here was working on um, articulating all of the work that the agency has done related to state accessibility requirements. And it's been a lot over the last year from new resources, new training, new tools available to staff. It also includes how we make sure our office space is accessible. We just rolled out a new website, making sure that has accessibility built in. How are our public meetings accessible by different modes um, for people who travel differently? What does our planning process look like? How do we ensure people with disabilities are part of the decision-making process? And then just as with Title VI, making sure our subrecipients are also following the ADA and their own grants. And then the last plan is our Disadvantaged Business Enterprise Plan. Uh, like I mentioned, this only focuses on one aspect of our work. It's our Section 5310 funding that comes through the Federal Transit Administration uh, because we do anticipate issuing contracts greater than $250,000. Uh, we have created a DBE plan, created a DBE goal. And so the plan does just over provide an overview of how we got to that goal, what are our different reporting and monitoring requirements, what have we created here at the agency to help us track this. And so this is part of our, a new part of our non-discrimination program moving forward. I mentioned we've held our public review period that started June 16th, closed July 17th with a public hearing before our board of directors. Uh, we did promote this through website announcements, social media posts, and an e-blast on your screen right now is just a screenshot of what that announcement e-blast looked like at the beginning of our public review period. It was also shared with our partners at CDOT, RTD, Federal Highway, and FTA, their various civil rights offices. Uh, the comments we did receive were from the Federal Transit Administration and were technical in nature, so uh, updating some of the language in the DBE plan to make sure we were um, covering the most recent language from changes earlier in the year, as well as some revisions to our disadvantaged business enterprise insert that we include in RFPs, making sure we were capturing all the information that was required. So coming back, we are before y'all now with a request for a recommendation to the RTC. We do look to go before the RTC in September and then the board for adoption and ultimately aiming for our October 1st deadline to have these submitted to our federal partners to remain in compliance and continue to have grants move forward. I do have a proposed motion for the committee, um, but I'm happy to take any questions before then. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alvin, for that overview. Um, do you have any questions or comments for Dr. Cogstaff? I am seeing. 
very thorough. <laughs> Really appreciate the overview, Alvin, um, and presenting these these four pieces for the uh, Title VI implementation. Also appreciate how gra graphically driven these uh, plans are, and making it easy to digest and appreciate the work that Dr. Cog has gone into updating these plans. Thank you. <clears throat> no comment or questions. Uh, we have a. Well, I got one question for staff. Why is it so dark in here? <laughs> Please, can we turn on the light? <laughs> Jacob don't want to answer. <laughs> well, Mr. Executive Director, because it's full blast, it looks like hospital lighting. Got it. Uh, but we can certainly turn it up if needed. <laughs> Thank you. So I move to um, recommend the, the action as proposed in the slide deck. And I'll second. Second. Any discussion? Thank you, Bill. Thank you, David. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? That is unanimously. Thank you, Alvin, and thank you, Cole. That concludes our action items for the day. Uh, we have um, two discussion items before us. Item number six in your packet, amendments to the Transportation Improvement Program set-aside policy. This is attachment D in your packet. Um, and this will be presented by Josh Schwenk, Senior Planner. All right, thank you, Chair. Hello again, everyone. Um, so about a year and a half ago, we did adopt a policy document that covers all eight of our set-aside programs associated with our Transportation Improvement Program. <laughs> Heard the darkness. <laughs> I'll let all of your eyes adjust. <laughs> So given the amount of time that has passed and some changes here at Dr. Cog, um, as well as external, uh, we thought it was time to revisit this document uh, and see if any changes were needed. So some of those changes that have occurred that sort of spurred this, we have passed a uh, transportation demand management strategic plan, which included some suggestions on how to change um, our transportation demand management set aside. Um, we piloted both the transportation corridor and community-based transportation planning set-asides and had some lessons learned from those, uh, which apply to all four of our new set-aside programs. Uh, associated with that, we have uh, furthered our development of intergovernmental agreements and uh, some additional, uh, excuse me, um, some additional uh, <laughs> uh, agreements with the Colorado Department of Transportation associated with those four new set-aside programs. Um, we have the new state accessibility policy uh, to consider and then just some general lessons learned that we wanted to implement uh, across all of our programs. So um, we have the, excuse me, here we go, uh, the redlined uh, working draft available to you in your packets. I'm not going to run through every single edit, uh, but I will uh, address some of the high-level changes associated uh, with this document. So hold, please. Um, so the first is we wanted to actually uh, sort of formalize a process for changing this document. It had always been our intent that we would be able to change this to update it as time went on, but we realized we did not have that written out in the document. So we've added amendment procedures to the document. Uh, this mirrors uh, our standard amendment procedures associated with documents like the Transportation Improvement Program, Unified Planning Work Program, et cetera. So we have a formal amendment uh, associated with more uh, substantial changes, such as changes to scoring criteria, eligibility guidelines, or amount of funding. And then we also have administrative modifications. So more of those clarifications to text, those can be addressed by staff. Um, without needing to bring it through a full amendment. 
Um, we've also updated the schedule just based on uh, some additional information that we now have available. Uh, we've made some changes uh, associated with when those calls for projects and um, project approvals will be expected to take place. Skipping ahead to our transportation demand management uh, set aside, we have updated um, the criteria here. A lot of these changes are um, more language changes, um, clarifying language, um, trying to bring that into um, kind of standardized languages that we use across our programs. Um, we've also made some changes here, just removing some references to infrastructure uh, because this is a non-infrastructure call for projects. Um, a lot of these, as I mentioned, were spurred by changes recommended through the TDM strategic plan um, and the planning process associated with that. Um, we've also rebalanced some of the weights between the various criteria. Um, I did want to note um, we clarified this access criteria to be benefits to marginalized communities. I think that was always kind of the intent, but we wanted to make that a bit um, clearer. Um, we also, uh, if you look through the program a bit further down, there is what used to be an environmental justice areas and is now uh, proposed to be the equity index area criteria. The reason for both of these um, being here is that the marginalized communities criterion really addresses the people um, targeted or using a service, whereas the equity index area is really looking at geography. Um, and the reason we changed this from the previous environmental justice area is we do have our new equity index um, that really looks at a more granular level um, throughout the region rather than just an in or out, you're either an EJ area or not. Um, now we can look at kind of quartiles across the region um, where a particular area might fall. Another change, um, can find it, there we go. And this is across all of our various programs. Uh, it's just a change to the website management section. We had initially intended um, each of the websites to really serve as kind of an archive of information associated with each of these. Um, given some of the constraints associated with uh, the accessibility policy as well as our own intention to really streamline our website, make it a lot simpler uh, for people to navigate, we did want to remove some of those requirements from this policy. It's still up to individual programs what they post out there, but we want to make sure that there's not a lot of information that is required to be posted that maybe would require a lot of ongoing maintenance to ensure it remains accessible into the future. So moving on to our regional transportation operations and technology set aside, RTO and T. Um, the big change here is really to the eligibility section, uh, really simplifying that rather than a list of illustrative potential eligible projects, really using a definition that is drawn from both uh, statute as well as the RTO and T strategic plan um, that really defines what is eligible and then at the same time, um, what is not eligible, really making that hopefully clearer for folks um, rather than reading through a substantial list of potential projects and seeing what might be closest associated with their project. The only change to the scoring criteria for this uh, program was a rebalancing of the weights. Uh, the actual scoring criterions themselves remain the same. Um, Jumping forward to our human service transportation set aside, um, we did have a change here just associated with the funding types. Um, in the past, this program was fully funded with state FASTER funds. We've added state MMOF and federal CMAC funds. Uh, so just making that clarification, there shouldn't be any substantial changes to the projects eligible, but each of those funding types does carry its own requirements. The final changes are associated with our new uh, set-asides. Um, so the corridors, community livability and innovation planning, those four set-asides, 
Um, one change that applies across all of them is a change to the match requirement. If I can find it, sorry. Um, so based on further negotiations with CDOT, uh, we are able to um, use some toll credits to eliminate match requirements across all four of these programs. So um, this language has changed across each of these to reflect that. Um, and then we also have a change to our innovative mobility project, oh, excuse me, um, innovative mobility set aside. Two real changes here. Uh, the initial plan for this set aside was that it would use kind of a cohort uh, model where a group of people would be, or a group of jurisdictions would be brought through together. Um, we're not so much focusing on that in the future. We were also looking at a potentially a hybrid model where some funds might be distributed directly to um, individual jurisdictions. We're also not moving forward with that. Thus, this program is going to keep those funds with Dr. Cog, similar to these other, uh, all four of these new set-aside programs. Dr. Cog will sort of handle the administration for that, keep that funding in-house, um, while partnering with jurisdictions in a stakeholder capacity. So those are the primary changes. Um, there are smaller changes throughout the document uh, that are noted in red line changes. Um, happy to take any comments or questions that the committee might have. Otherwise, next steps would be to bring this document through um, for action at your next meeting and then followed by RTC and board and then have this become the active version of the policy applying to all of our set-aside programs. Does, I'm sorry, yeah. is that, does that sorry. conclude your presentation? Yeah, or? it does. Okay. <laughs> um, Kent Mormon. I've got three questions. Um, on page nine, you talk about the policy. Can you just give an example where it would be administrative versus going through an amendment process uh, on that, um, page nine and 10? Yes. Uh, I, I think you're doing it now. You're just trying to put it in, but I just curious where that dividing line is. Yes, so administrative might be something like changing uh, clarifying language. So for instance, um, in a couple places, uh, we have references to, um, for instance, historically marginalized populations versus marginalized communities, just trying to be consistent with that language throughout the document. A change like that, that really doesn't have um, a, a an impact to the actual substance of the program that could be uh, performed administratively, whereas something that we're like shifting the weight between um, scoring criteria, something that's actually going to have a substantive impact on that program, we would bring that through as a formal amendment. Okay, thank you. Um, the second question is, I think it's page 21. Um, it's, on, um, it's on the category serves Dr. Cog's designated urban centers. Um, so it might be the next page on yours there. Um, mm -hmm. It seems like serving Dr. Cog's designated urban centers from discussions we've had in the past doesn't match the scoring because it says it's got to be located in the urban center. Um, and before it was serving the it, serving the, the urban center. So it's wondering why the change. Um, you know, it's either because you either get zero or five, and it, serving a designated urban center could be bringing people into that center. And I think that's what we had discussed previously. So I'm a little concerned about that and was wondering the, the, the thought behind changing that because then you need to change the category to in Dr. Cog designated urban center. So, it, but as I recall, we had long discussions about making sure it serves it so that someone coming in from the outside, we're still bringing them into an urban center to, to really encourage the use of urban centers, not spread out everywhere. No, I think that's a really good point. I'll raise that with the set-aside manager for this program and see if we can clarify that because I, I imagine you're actually correct. Um, and, and serving is probably the correct language here. So we'll see if we can get that corrected. And, and then the third question I have goes to page 27. I think it's on the RO. RTOT, um, you scratched out the word technology. So does the the title need to change? Um, the technical. Uh, it's uh, sorry. 
I think it's on there. Oh, it's the next page. Under eligible projects, yeah. You, you took out the word technology, and we worked really hard to put that in several years back. And um, I just was curious what the thought behind it, taking out the word technology. Is it a funding re issue, or is it, or is it just a, a different interpretation now? Because we really wanted to emphasize the use of technology. Technology is still eligible for this program. I think the intent there was to tie it back to that specific phrase operational improvement, which I believe is drawn from statute, which is cited there. So I, I think that was the intention there. Technology improvements are certainly still eligible. Um, and, and from that definition, I think that becomes clear reading into that a bit more. But um, you're right. Potentially, we can, we can add that back into that first bullet as a, um, as a clarifying point. Thank you. That's all I have. Thank you, Kent. Brian Weimer. How about that? Hello, hello. Can you hear me now? So thank you. Uh, while you're close, if you can go to uh, page 29, please where you have a suggested minimum, which implies no minimum. Um, so what's the thought press process behind that? And is it a $10 item or is it a $25 item? What is, what is that number? I guess I would think that there would be a minimum uh, associated with it, but I'm curious what the concept was. Yeah, so in the past, this was a, um, set minimum at $100,000 federal. Um, through discussions with locals, it was determined there might be some projects that come in a little bit lower than that. Um, that would be sort of the, say, preferred minimum, but through negotiations with those project sponsors, potentially there is some opportunity for lower cost um, projects. As, as you're aware, you know, that sort of balance of when does it become sort of worthwhile to federalize a project can also impact project sponsors thinking on when to sort of enter into the federal process. Um, so in some cases, they may not want to federalize a project that is under that, um, but there might be some scenarios where that is, um, that is potentially helpful to that project sponsor and it would still accomplish the, the goals of the program. So. That was added in just to add a little bit of flexibility there. Um, we would still suggest 100,000 federal, but in cases where it came in below that, we could discuss that essentially. Is there a dollar amount that Dr. Cog feels is not worth your time? Um, I don't believe we have a set dollar amount, um, but um, that's, that's a good question, and I can bring this back with Greg um, and discuss with him if we want to maybe firm up this language a little bit. Are there questions? Come, oh, Doug, Doug Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much, and appreciate the conversation on this today. Um, listen, I know this is a lot, and if you have any further conversations or any further comments you would like to make to Dr. Cog about some of this before it comes back to you as an action item, if you would share those in the next couple weeks, that would be wonderful. Um, I think the very good points were raised today that I think staff will take, take another closer look at, but please, just, just forward them in, and we'll be sure to... Uh, to note those so that we know specifically what to have the conversation about at the next meeting. Appreciate you. Thank you. Doug? Are there questions or comments at this time? Well, thank you very much. Thank you, Josh, for bringing this before us before um, this is an action item over the next uh, month or so. So please uh, take a deeper dive and any questions or comments, please do send those along to Dr. Cog as soon as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Our next item is item uh, number seven, a discussion item on South Boulder Road and Alameda Avenue Corridor Studies Final Report. This is attachment E in your packet. And Nora Kern, Dr. Cog Sub Area and Pro 
project planning program manager will lead this item. All right, um, thank you, Chair. So really excited today to be here to kind of wrap up two of our first quarter planning studies um, and share just a few of the highlights for each of the studies and kind of the process that we went through. I will note the full report for each of these studies will be on our website in the coming days. We're still touching up accessibility remediation. Um, if you want to see it before it's posted, we do have the, the unremediated version we'd be happy to share with you. And we, sh we anticipate having both of them on our website within two weeks. So just a quick recap. There we go. Um, for those not as familiar, th these are our first two projects that are part of our quarter planning program. We did kind of start with the pilots with these first two, and since then it has kind of been expanded and formalized as the quarter planning set aside. So both of these projects started in 2022. Um, the two are the Alameda Quarter Study and the South Boulder Road Quarter Study. Um, and both of them are really close partnerships with a, well, a lot of you, member governments, um, and, and others who aren't here today. So definitely been a, a good learning process and a good collaborative process on these two projects. Um, so both of the projects, they are distinct, but they followed a very similar process. Um, they were both somewhat of a first step study. So these are corridors that hadn't had a ton of work um, on them, at least at the regional level. So. Um, for each of them, we worked with a, a TAC or a project management committee, which, in, which included all of the jurisdictions, the local jurisdictions, as well as CDOT and RTD um, that were impacted by the project. That group met monthly throughout the last year or more to kind of um, guide and steer each of the studies. Um, for each, we also had a steering committee that included elected officials, um, nonprofit representatives, other community stakeholders that uh, had an interest in each study, and those met about four or five times. Um, and then each study, we kind of followed, uh, you know, we had an existing conditions analysis. We looked at developing goals and kind of a vision, which was really important for these projects because, again, these are kind of a first step visioning type um, studies. And then we had um, fairly extensive community engagement and ended up with some recommendations and some next steps. So I'm going to start, I'm kind of run through these quickly, but um, again, happy to share the full reports if someone wants to dive into them. Um, or take any questions. So the, the first study we did was the South Boulder Road Quarter Study. This was a partnership with the City of Boulder, City of Lafayette, City of Louisville, the county, um, Boulder County, and then um, RTD. So um, obviously this corridor is really important to the, to the region. Um, it was identified both in the Regional Transportation Plan as a uh, priority transit corridor, and it's been recommended through the you know, Northwest Area Mobility Study for future analysis of potential future BRT. Uh, some of the kind of high level things we learned, you know, in terms of travel patterns, um, on the, the western end in Boulder, a lot of the trips are, are fairly long. So kind of those regional trips commuting in and out of Boulder from the surrounding areas. On the eastern end, they tend to be more local. Um, from a demographics and land use perspective, there are a few kind of higher scoring equity communities um, and in the East in particular, you know, significant planned growth that's anticipated in the coming decades. Um, just a couple snapshots of some of the things we looked at. Safety was very important. So you can see there's a number of locations that were identified um, as having a high level um, of safety service, meaning higher than expected crashes based on kind of the, the volumes. Um, we also looked, uh, a big piece of the study was looking at transit speeds. So you can see just one of the examples. This is the AM peak um, RTD dash speeds, and you can see where it's really getting bogged down, particularly kind of coming out of Broadway and, and Boulder, um, speeds up as you go through Boulder County, and then slows back down kind of as you get through Louisville and Lafayette. So great data to kind of think about what improvements could, could be made to get the bus moving faster and have a more reliable service. And we have more of a lot of these maps, so if you want to dive in, we have a number of others to kind of look at different angles as well. Um, for our engagement, um, we did have a project website hosted on Dr. Cog's social pinpoint. Um, and then you can see we had two kind of um, phases of engagement. The first one was really just trying to understand what's going on in these corridors, what are people's current concerns, challenges, um, and vision for where, where it's going to go. Um, our second survey or second uh, phase was really focused on um, taking some draft ideas to the community to see are we heading in the right direction? Um, have we kind of heard what you would like to see for this quarter? So really great feedback. Again, thanks to, to Boulder City and County, Louisville and Lafayette for helping with, with all of that. Um, and 
yeah, I'll keep moving along. We did develop this vision um, for the corridor, and you can see this is really kind of a forward-looking vision. They're definitely thinking there are some immediate needs, including some recent or ongoing projects, but a lot of the focus was really where do we want to go on this corridor? How do we kind of realize some of the big priorities um, that the, the region has, particularly you know, addressing growing region, uh, multimodal connectivity, safety, um, and transit performance were all things that really stood out to the group. And last, so just the kind of high level of the recommendations, you know, we, we actually have um, fairly detailed recommendations for each of the jurisdictions. So one for one kind of section for the city of Boulder, for the county, for Louisville and for Lafayette. Um, but there were a couple kind of shared goals for the entire corridor. Um, first was looking at really exploring the feasibility of a consistent corridor wide separated bicycle facility. This is something we heard about a lot. It's fairly patchy kind of depending on where you are in the corridor. Um, and there's a lot of room for opportunity, particularly in the Boulder County section that has a fairly r wide right of way. So we didn't determine a specific solution, um, but I think we got the conversation going and have kind of set up Boulder County and others to kind of take this to the next level to start diving into exactly what that might look like. Um, and then the second kind of corridor wide recommendation was um, really at looking at how to improve um, transit and kind of start moving towards kind of a higher capacity, higher reliability, higher quality transit service along the corridor. So again, more conversations, you know, will be had. Um, Boulder County has actually received TIP funding to do kind of a part two study that's going to really dive into a little bit of an alternative analysis for the transit piece. So um, we're excited to continue to part with, partner with everyone on that kind of next step. So Alameda corridor, um, for this one, we worked very closely with Lakewood, Denver, Aurora, RTD, and CDOT. It's a 14 mile corridor. So this is definitely kind of a first bite at the apple, but still um, probably has plenty of work to do in the coming years. Um, just again, some of the highlights from what's going on in this corridor. Um, I think most of us know this corridor has been identified on the BRT network in the 2030 to 2039 staging period. So this was kind of a, a first kind of conversation to see what that could look like. Um, it's also been in Denver Move Transit. Um, and then there's a number of really kind of critical ongoing planning efforts that we had to kind of coordinate around, which um, I think presented a lot of opportunities, but some challenges members of the public got a little confused at times. Um, from the demographics and land use perspective, I think the thing that jumped out just most to us is there are you know, fairly significant equity populations, particularly in West Denver and Aurora. So we wanted to make sure we, we focused on listening to those communities and tailoring rec um, recommendations to them. And then from a travel pattern perspective, I think the thing that just jumped out is this, while it is a very key east-west corridor, there's not a lot of people traveling from Lakewood to Aurora on this corridor. People are making mile, couple mile trips to kind of get to where they need to go. And so I think that's an important consideration as we think kind of in the future, we're not looking at moving people 14 miles, we're looking at kind of the smaller distances. Um, from a crash perspective, you can see there are, um, there have been a number of fatal crashes. This corridor is on the high injury network, um, you know, uh, kind of clustered more on the eastern and western end, which is kind of interesting, um, but kind of definitely, you know, critical areas throughout um, and a couple, couple kind of key hotspots that um, we, you know, hope to be able to work with everybody on. Um, again, on transit, we dove into a lot of data. If you want to get, get more info, can, we'll can share the report. Um, but just kind of one of the snapshots, we looked at delay both between the stops as well as at the stops to really understand what are the pinch points. And as we start to think about BRT or just improved transit, what, what do we need to focus on? And you can say, see here between the stops, um, there are particularly kind of leading up to the ma major intersections, Alameda, Federal, Sheridan, University, um, at pretty much each one of them, there's kind of signif there's significant delay um, leading into the stops. Um, and so I think you know, this data will be really helpful thinking about what, we didn't get into the details of what BRT will look like, but I think this will help inform that conversation um, as we kind of think along this corridor. Um, just a snapshot of our engagement, it, it was fairly similar, at least in, in structure to the South Boulder Road engagement. Um, one thing to note is we did start with five focus groups the corridor was divided into six segments just because it is so different from Lakewood, you know, West Denver, East Denver, all the way out to Aurora. So we wanted to really make sure we heard distinctly from each group. So you can see kind of some of the things we did throughout, um, but got really great feedback and were able to build off of some of the other projects that have been going on, like 
um, Deborah moved Cherry Creek was happening right before this so that we kind of just got to, to tack on and, and use some of the great feedback that they heard through that process. Um, the vision again, um, you know, I think definitely wanting to look at more modes. Folks wanted to emphasize transit as a primary mode. It's definitely currently a very car oriented corridor. Um, and then we also heard a lot about preserving character. You know, Alameda maybe isn't at the top of everyone's mind for, you know, um, corridors to visit in the region, but for a lot of people who live and work here, it's a very important culturally and um, community centered corridor. So we wanted to make sure that was preserved and enhanced kind of in the coming coming years. So the recommendations, um, again, we had kind of a quarter wide recommendation, which was to advance the bus rapid transit. We, we heard a lot of support for that. Um, the transit has a, a long way to go, I would say, on the corridor. It's definitely below kind of um, what people need to get where, to where they need to go. This is not um, you know, super detailed, but just starting to think about what might major stops be, what are the key crossing um, transit and BRT routes, just kind of starting the conversation. We did decide not to get into the center running, side running, mixed traffic conversation because that's a whole conversation in and of itself. So we wanted to kind of set the stage for that conversation probably as a next step. Um, and then in addition, we looked at um, a number of multimodal improvements, um, safety improvements, um, kind of just general operations improvements throughout the corridor that again are broken up by jurisdiction and by segment. So you can see some of the examples of what those included here. So just looking ahead, um, like I said, the, the final reports will be on our website within a couple of weeks. We have shifted our attention to the first two set-aside projects, the East Colfax BRT extension alternatives analysis um, and the Sheridan Corridor Safety Study. And then just a reminder, the call for projects for the next round will be next summer. Um, so if you are curious in this program and have ideas for, for future corridors, definitely feel free to reach out before then. So with that, happy to take any questions if there are any. Nora, thank you for that thumbnail of those two studies. Um, Rieger. Yep, thank you, Chair Grant. Um, just wanted to put a bow on this by saying, uh, connecting back to Rick Pilgrim's point at the beginning of this meeting, um, this is a brand new program uh, for us. This is one of two new programs that Nora and her team are leading uh, related to both corridor and community planning. Um, this is the first time that we've sort of initiated and led um, Dr. Cog, you know, sort of direct corridor studies. Um, I think Nora and her team have set a really high bar uh, for future studies and the work that um, they've done on these two corridors. Um, so just want to recognize both Nora and her team as well as the staff uh, from all the jurisdictions that were involved in these two corridor studies that were a big part of uh, making both of these successful. Thank you. Thanks, Jacob. Brian Lammer. I have a couple questions. First question, um, what was the cost of both of these studies? Yeah, so the Alameda was 300,000 and the South Boulder Road was 200,000. And then we also did, you know, have a lot of, spent a lot of art staff time, which is, yeah, in addition to that, as well as all of our, a lot of time with our member governments. Okay. And then next, uh, since this is a pilot project, what was the lessons learned to move forward with kind of the okay. next studies? So communities kind of know what maybe we should be looking at. Yeah, that's a great question. We actually had a debrief, I think, last week just with our internal team. Um, you know, I think a, every study is different, so I think that was something we acknowledge. These studies have a little bit different focus than the East Colfax um, extension and Sheridan will, so, you know, there's going to be some similarities and some differences. Um, I think one of my lessons learned is I think both the value and the challenge of doing these regional studies, you know, a lot of these corridors have local projects that are ongoing or planned or in some level of progress, um, but they hadn't really had a chance to look, you know, all the way out to a Lakewood or all the way out to Aurora, Denver, Sense, or kind of in the collaborative approach on South Boulder Road. And I think that is super important, particularly when you're thinking about these connected transportation facilities. You don't want to have a, a bike lane or a transit route that ends or is totally different, you know, in one jurisdiction to the next. So that, that regional perspective is really important, but it also takes more time. And so really with Dr. Cog in the lead, you know, we need to be really intentional in making sure we're working closely with um, the, the governments and the jurisdictions along each. And I think we we're fortunate in that we had really great partnership, I think, from all of the, the jurisdictions on this project, but just a reminder that it takes time and it takes money. You know, we can't, we don't have a, a mailing list of Dr. Cog, you know, residents who we can just send out info to. So we really have to work closely with the member governments to, to make sure we're working in lockstep with them. Mm -hmm. 
Pilgrim. Thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, Nora, I, I'm uh, <laughs> Jacob. Kind of um, jumped in ahead of me. I'm, I'm very impressed with what you've done here, and uh, that's because often the separate jurisdiction has to initiate things, or they try to get their neighbor to go along with things. And uh, I like the framework of having um, the map from a few years ago of these corridors and then being able to take those forward and do what you've done. Um, what, what would be a next step? Would the next step still reside at Dr. Cog or would it go to this pick, uh, Boulder County? Does it go to Louisville, Brighton, Boulder County? What's next? Yeah, I think um, that's a great question and something we've talked about um, kind of throughout. I think there's a couple of next steps on each of them. So for the you know regional transit projects, I think we are really looking in, in Boulder County. Um, uh, that, on that study, the Boulder County is going to take the lead looking at an alternative analysis and really getting into the options. Um, for, there are also a number of um, intersections projects studies that kind of were identified, and so those will fall to Boulder, Louisville, Lafayette. Um, and so I think it's going to be a mixture. And, and I will say I think we're also open where needed to be a part of the next step. So I think for Alameda, for example, um, you know, that would be a quarter that could be eligible again in 25. Um, I know the next step on that quarter for the transit piece, at least, would be doing kind of a formal alternatives analysis. And that's kind of the type of study we're doing on East Colfax Extension. So whether it's us, whether it's RTD or Denver or somebody else, um, that type of study is probably the next step for that one. Um, and we're kind of still working through who takes the lead on what and how we kind of move that forward. Doug Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair, very much. I, um, Nora, I had a question, and it relates back to, to Brian Weimer's question with regards to lessons learned from internally. I was wondering if there is an opportunity or if it has been done yet to kind of survey the member jurisdictions that were involved to see what their lessons learned were in this and, you know, whether they saw value in it and or if ways to improve. The yeah. Yes, we, I did have some wrap-up questions. Um, we're having a happy hour tomorrow at Southern Sun for the Boulder folks if you want to come out and share lessons learned. So, yeah, we, I, they've been very helpful kind of passing along specific feedback. We had a conversation at the end of each study, and then we are going to have a, a social gathering for each to kind of talk through anything that's easier that way. <laughs> but, yeah, great idea. Mayor <laughs> Slater. I just want to echo all the uh, positive feedback uh, and participating in the Boulder, uh, South Boulder Road uh, review team from the city of Boulder. Um, uh, I, I see a lot of parallels in the way this was organized with um, the, and the drainage world uh, where you have Mile High Flood District that brings together communities that share uh, a watershed. Here you've got travel sheds where you're sort of bringing that together. My question is how um, the eligibility for funding for these planning efforts um, uh, is affected by whether or not they are on the state highway system? Yes, for the corridor planning program. So the, the corridor planning program is actually restricted only to the projects identified in the regional transportation plan, which I think you have to be on the highway or on the uh, regional roadway system to be eligible. I'm looking for a Jacob to correct me. <laughs> yeah, that's correct. The state highway designation doesn't matter as much as being on the regional roadway system, but this corridor planning program is really intentional about implementing the corridor and project priorities in the regional transportation plan. And that was actually our universe of eligible projects, um, both for the pilot program and for the, uh, for the program going forward. And I, I will add, we do, of the kind of the suite of new set-asides, of which this is one of four, there are three others that are don't have that restriction just to the projects in the regional transportation plan. So the community-based transportation planning program is looking at some corridors, and some of those are not projects in the regional transportation plan, although they are generally on the regional roadway system. And then I think, like, livable centers could also be looking at a corridor, but maybe from a little bit more of a land use perspective. I don't know if that answered your question. Yeah. Are there questions or comments for Dr. Cogstaff? Thank you very much, Nora. Thank you so much for this presentation and all this innovative work that Dr. Cog is doing to break new ground and bring us together on our regional corridors. Thank you. 
That concludes our discussion items for today. So our final items are some administrative um, aspects of the member, com member comments and other manners. So um, I believe we have an update for the Advanced Mobility Partnership Working Group update. Carson, do we have an update? Yeah, I do. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, the AMP Working Group met earlier this month as a part of our kind of bi-monthly new meeting schedule. Uh, the group discussed various mobility hub efforts that are happening around the region and state. Uh, at the large scale level, CDOT discussed their ongoing mobility hub efforts around the region and state. Transportation Solutions discussed their Denver University DU-based mobility hubs. Uh, and Smart Commute, my, myself, gave a presentation about our e-mobility hub pilots at the small scale uh, going on in the North Metro region. So kind of an overview of all different kinds of mobility hubs in the region. I'll take any questions if you have any. Thank you, Carson. Any uh, questions from members for with the Advanced Mobility Partnership? Any other updates from other members you'd like to bring forward? Brian Weimer. Uh, yes, just a um, FYI, um, DOLA has started to push out their maps for 1313 and the parking legislation in terms of what is available and I think they're taking comments through September 9th. So uh, those of you that are interested um, can make comments with regard to that. And um, I think the only one that um, hasn't been pushed out yet is what we looked at at least this morning was the walkable sheds if you will, uh, associated with 1313, but that's supposed to be coming out here shortly. So. Uh. Thank you, Brian, very timely. Doug Rex. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just wanted to follow up with a question on that. So Brian, are they posting those on their, on the DOLA website or? The, that's where we got, got okay. them. So you can take a look at that. Thank you. Doug, they're on the DOLA website. There are several links, yeah. Mormon. I, I saw one of those maps today and I was a little surprised of what they didn't put on, um, like our inline stations. Of course, they're not existing yet, but they are planned. They're not on there, but they also didn't have the Thornton Park and Ride on there, which was really kind of interesting at ADA. So um, we're, we're looking, and I guess there's another meeting tomorrow that will be some questions. We have someone involved in it. Best. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to let um, members know that CDOT is hosting our strategic highway safety plan meetings. Hopefully your agencies have heard or someone at your agency has heard the Region 1 um, sessions are being hosted Thursday, September 12th. That one is in person. And then there's a virtual session October 2nd. So if you're not aware, please let me know um, or Jordan or Marissa and we can get you connected uh, with folks that can help you get the information, but would really love to see and hear from all of you on uh, Achieving Vision Zero. Thank you, Jessica. Any further updates from members? Okay. Thank you very much, everybody. So our next meeting will be um, September 23rd, 2024. If you did not sign in, please be sure you sign in at the table or with Dr. Cog's staff to be sure you're registered as attending. Thank you for your participation today. And we are now adjourned at 2.39 p.m.